love for you to turn your attention to Daniel chapter 11 this evening, and we're continuing our study of Daniel's last vision. And I want to give you something of a long intro this evening. I'm going to tell you the story of seven brothers and one courageous mother. And this comes from 2 Maccabees chapter 7. 2 Maccabees is intertestamental literature. It's not inspired. This is not biblical. This is something like reading something from church history, only it's between the testaments. So after the Old Testament goes silent, before the New Testament is written, Jews were writing. This is historical related to the time that Daniel himself predicts. And just to let the cat out of the bag a little bit, Uh, I'm giving you this illustration because I believe it illustrates the way Jews were fortified during the darkest days of intertestamental history. In fact, the darkest days of Jewish history prior to the future reign of the Antichrist on the earth. And they were fortified perhaps even by the truths of Daniel chapter 11. So here's the story of seven brothers and one courageous mother from 2 Maccabees 7. It came to pass that seven brothers with their mother were taken. By the way, I'm going to try to edit. This is written in King James. I'm going to try to edit some of the king's English. Eliminate the these and thou's. If some slip through, forgive me. Seven brothers with their mother were taken and compelled by the king against the law to taste swine's flesh and were tormented with scourges and whips. The setting here is the time of Antiochus Epiphanes, Antiochus IV. He is the king that is referred to in 2 Maccabees. One of the brothers spoke first, said this, What would you ask or learn of us? We are ready to die rather than to transgress the laws of our fathers. Then the king, being in rage, commanded pans and cauldrons to be made hot. Which forthwith being heated, he commanded to cut out the tongue of the one that spoke first and to cut off the utmost parts of his body, the rest of his brothers and his mother looking on. Now when he was thus maimed in all of his members, the king commanded him yet being alive to be brought to the fire and to be fried in a pan. And as the vapors of the pan uh, were dispersed, the brothers exhorted one another with the mother for him to die manfully. Saying thus, the Lord God looks upon us and in truth has, comforted, has comfort in us as Moses in his song, which witness to their faces declared saying, and he shall be comforted in his servants. So when the first was dead after this number, they brought the second brother to make him a mocking stock. And when they had pulled off the skin of his head with the hair, they asked him, will you eat before you be punished throughout every member of your body? And he answered in his own language and said, no. Wherefore, he also received the next torment in order as his other brother had. And when he was at the last gasp, he said, you like a fury takest us, takest, takest, taketh, taketh us, us. You take us out of this present life. But the king of the world will raise us up who have died for his laws unto everlasting life. After him, the third brother made a mocking stock. And when he was required to taste pork, he put out his tongue, and that right soon, holding forth his, man, his hands manfully. And he said courageously, These I had from heaven, and for his laws I despise them, and from him I hope to receive them again. Insomuch that the king and they that were with him marveled at the young man's courage, for he did not regard the pains Now, when this man was dead also, they tormented and mangled the fourth brother in like manner. When he was ready to die, he said thus, It is good being put to death by men to look for hope from God to be raised up again by him. As for you, king, you shall have no resurrection to life. Afterward, they brought the fifth brother and they mangled him. Then he looked unto the king and he said, You have have power over men. You are corruptible. You do what you will. Yet think not that our nation is forsaken of God. Abide a while and behold his great power, and he will torment you and your seed. 
After him, they brought the sixth brother, who also being ready to die, said, Be not deceived without cause, for we suffer these things for ourselves. We have sinned against God. Therefore, marvelous things are being done to us. But do not think that you take in hand to strive against God, that you will escape unpunished. The mother was marvelous above all and worthy of honorable memory. For when she saw her seven sons slain within the space of one day, she bare it with good courage because of the hope that she had in the Lord. Yes, she exhorted every one of them in her own language, filled with courageous spirits, stirring up her womanish thoughts with a manly stomach. She said unto them, I cannot tell how you came into my womb, for I neither gave you breath nor life, neither was it I that formed the members of every one of you, but doubtless the creator of the world who formed the generation of man and found out the beginning of all things will also of his own mercy give you breath and life again, as you now regard not your own selves for his sake." Now Antiochus, thinking himself despised and suspecting it to be reproachful speech, while the youngest was still alive, he not only exhorted him by words, but also assured him with oaths that he would make him both a rich and happy man if he would turn from the laws of his fathers. He would also take him for his friend and trust him with his affairs. But when the young man would in no case hearken unto him, the king called his mother and exhorted her that she should counsel the young man to save his life. And when he exhorted her with many words, she promised the king that she would counsel her son. But bowing herself toward him, laughing the cruel tyrant to scorn, she spoke in her country language in this manner, O oh, my son, have pity upon me that, bear, that bore thee nine months in the womb, and nourished thee, and brought thee up into this age, and endured the troubles of education." I beseech thee, my son, look upon the heaven and the earth and all that is therein and consider that God made them of things that were not, and so was mankind made likewise. Fear not this tormentor, but being worthy of thy brothers, take your death that I may receive you again in mercy with your brothers. And while she was still speaking these words, the youngest brother said, what are you waiting for, O king? I will not obey your commandment. I will obey the commandment of the law of God that was given unto our fathers by Moses. And you, you have been the author of all mischief against the Hebrews. You shall not escape the hands of God. We suffer because of our sins. And though the living Lord be angry with us for a little while, our chastening and, cor and correction, yet shall he be at one again with his servants. But thou, O godless man, and of all most wicked, be not lifted up without a cause, nor puffed up with uncertain hopes, lifting up your hand against the servants of God, for you have not yet escaped the judgment of Almighty God who sees all things. For our brethren, who have now suffered a short pain, are dead under God's covenant of everlasting life, but you, through the judgment of God, will receive just punishment for your pride. I, as my brothers, offer up my body and my life for the laws of our fathers, beseeching God that he would speedily be merciful unto our nation, and that thou by torments and plagues may confess that he alone is God. In me and in my brothers, the wrath of the Almighty, which is justly brought upon our nation, may cease. Then the king's being enraged handed him worse than all the rest and took it grievously that he was mocked. So this man died undefiled and put his whole trust in the Lord. Last of all the sons, the mother was killed. It's a remarkable story. And he gives testimony to those who counted on God's promises, not only resurrection promise unto eternal life. This is written second century BC, but also God's promises to his people Israel. A recognition that the things that were happening to Israel were just punishment from God, but the weapons, the tools, the implements that God was using to bring purification and correction to Israel would themselves not go unpunished. Pretty remarkable faith. What we're looking at tonight in Daniel chapter 11, verses 21 to 35, is the reign of terror of Antiochus Epiphanes, Antiochus IV, and, and I've titled this message the Anti-Antichrist. Anti, A-N-T-E, is a word which simply means before, and anti, against. So the Antichrist is the still yet future, awful ruler who will be on the earth during the Great Tribulation. The anti-Antichrist is the one before him who prefigures him. 
and Antiochus Epiphanes, the anti-Antichrist, the one who goes before, is a foreshadow of the Antichrist to come. Their lives are similar and dissimilar. The details in Daniel chapter 11 are pretty remarkable. Uh, they do some similar things, and yet they are distinguishable characters separated by now at least thousands of years. We're going to look this evening at the three-stage reign of terror of Antiochus Epiphanes. And we'll read each section as we go through each stage. Stage one of this reign of terror is his rise to power. It is found in Daniel 11, verses 21 to 23. Follow along as I read this. In his place, a despicable person will arise, on whom the honor of kingship has not been conferred, but he will come in a time of tranquility and seize the kingdom by intrigue. The overflowing forces will be flooded away before him and shattered, and also the prince of the covenant. After an alliance is made with him, he will practice deception, and he will go up and gain power with a small force of people. This is the rise of power of Antiochus Epiphanes. Notice verse 21 begins with, in his place. This is in the place of the leaders of the Syrian empire. You remember we looked at the Seleucids and the Ptolemies last week. We'll have a map up again in a few moments to, to remind ourselves geographically where these things are happening. But this is the successor to the Seleucid empire. And so the first words, the first description we have of this new ruler of the Seleucid empire is a despicable person. You think about everything we looked at last week, this tiresome history of the details of the Syrian wars, the Ptolemies and the Seleucids, and it is like a, a, a terrible soap opera of murder and mayhem. Is this ringing in your ears? It's ringing in my ears. It's ringing. Okay. Sorry about that. Should I go with the pulpit mic? collector, a guy named Heliodorus, to get the tribute money to pay Rome. They couldn't afford to pay the tribute money to Rome, and the Roman army was on them to pay up. So he raided the temple treasury in Jerusalem. He was stopped there, supposedly, by a vision of angels. He left the temple, and then Heliodorus poisoned Seleucus IV. Uh, ostensibly to gain the throne for himself, tax collector to king. It may have been that Heliodorus was in league or at the behest of Antiochus III's brother, Antiochus IV, who was a hostage in Rome. Antiochus IV made bribes and deals with the Romans. He had learned some Roman ways. He knew the might of the Roman war machine, and he worked his way out of being held hostage in Rome, probably making bribery deals and agreements with them behind the scenes. He may have been helped by the tax collector, and he slides into Syria, back to the capital Antioch, and takes over the throne. Seleucus IV's son, Demetrius, was the rightful heir, but he was shipped off to Rome and held hostage there. So Antiochus IV, Antiochus Epiphanes, Epiphanes means the manifest one, the illustrious one, hey, I'm here, everybody pay attention to me although that uh, title was changed to Antiochus Epimenes by his enemies, which meant something like madman, and he was a madman. He took the throne by intrigue and by alliances and by bribes and by promises. The Hebrew text here literally says by slippery places. He slipped in by chicanery. Verse 22 tells us the overflowing forces will be flooded away before him and shattered. Those overflowing forces are the armies of the Ptolemies back down in Egypt. I think we have, let's put the map up so we just remind ourselves the geography here. The Seleucids are the yellow, the big yellow up top of modern day Iraq and Persia and Iran and Syria and Turkey. And then the Ptolemies in the Egyptian area are the greens down below. 
So all of chapter 11 has been the wars between the north and the south, the six Syrian wars between the Seleucids and the Ptolemies. And you remember that the Seleucids and the Ptolemies are the southern two parts of the four-part breakup of the former Grecian Empire under Alexander the Great. So Alexander the Great conquered the world, was the Grecian Empire after him. He had no heirs, his two sons were murdered, and the Grecian Empire was split up into four empires, just like Daniel had prophesied centuries before. And then the focus of Daniel focuses in on these southern two sections, the Seleucids and the Ptolemies, and they're duking it out throughout Daniel chapter 11. All of that gets us to this climactic scene where Antiochus IV, Antiochus Epiphanes, is the center of attention. And we'll see why he is the center of attention in a book written to the people of Israel. In verse 22, he is said to destroy the Egyptian armies. He overflooded them. They, the overflowing forces of the Egyptians were flooded away before the armies of the Seleucids under Antiochus, and they were destroyed. Um, also, the Prince of the Covenant. That's probably a reference um, to the, 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 the land of the covenant was Israel. The word covenant shows up several times in this chapter and seems always to be a reference to Israel. The Prince of the Covenant may be a reference to the high priest in Israel overseeing temple sacrifices at the time. His name was Onias. Onias was high priest. He was murdered in 172 BC by his brother who was in league with Antiochus IV Epiphanes. So to shatter the prince of the covenant probably is this prophetic description of the murder of Onias, the high priest, in 172. Look in verse 23, after an alliance is made with him, that is, after an alliance is made between the Seleucids and the Ptolemies, between Antiochus IV and Ptolemy VII down in Egypt, uh, after that alliance is made, he will practice deception and he will go up and gain power with a small force of people. Antiochus IV historically made a deal with Ptolemy VII, and he deceived him, he gained power, and he gained power with a small army, a small army that went from small town to small town in the outlying areas of Egypt, consolidating power in secret. He made an alliance with Ptolemy, said, hey, I have no interest in Egypt, and then he went into the margins of Egypt and started taking town by town by town with a small army. This leads us to stage two of the reign of terror under Antiochus Epiphanes. Stage two is his wars with Egypt. This covers verses 24 to 30. Look down at verse 24 of Daniel 11. In a time of tranquility, he will enter the richest parts of the realm, that is the realm of Egypt, and he will accomplish what his fathers never did, nor his ancestors. He will distribute plunder and possessions among them. He will devise his schemes against strongholds, but only for a time. Here, Antiochus Epiphanes, again, with more slippery schemes, pulls sort of a Robin Hood scheme in Egypt. He goes into the wealthiest parts of the land of Egypt, and he steals with his small army, he steals from all the, the wealthiest people, and he begins to distribute it to the common people in Egypt. So he is winning favors amongst the Egyptians by pulling a Robin Hood, steal from the rich to feed the poor. He was building his power base in Egypt against the Ptolemies, while the Ptolemies believed that he was in agreement with them not to touch Egypt. So he is again slimy and usurping power. Look at verse 25. Uh, he will stir up his strength and courage against the king of the south with a large army. So the king of the south will mobilize an extremely large and mighty army for war, but he will not stand for schemes will be devised against him. So here Antiochus IV is, is uh, leaving the scheme of uh, working small town to small town with his small army playing Robin Hood. He gets his large army together and Ptolemy VI gets his large army together and they meet in battle at Pelusium in 170 BC. Uh, but notice in the end of verse 25, the king of the south, that is Ptolemy VI, will not stand Schemes will be devised against him. Ptolemy VI was betrayed by his own people. They were scheming against him in league with Antiochus IV. Whether or not they read the tea leaves and saw who was going to be in power and decided, I need to side with the guy who's going to win, or whether they had been bought off by bribes from Antiochus IV, they betrayed the Ptolemies. Verse 
So the Egyptians put Ptolemy the seventh in place of his brother Ptolemy the sixth. Ptolemy the sixth and Antiochus the fourth. Apparently, Ptolemy the sixth here is in exile. They come to the table. Look at verse twenty-seven. As for both of these kings, this is most likely Ptolemy the sixth and Antiochus the fourth. Their hearts will be intent on evil, and they will speak lies to each other at the same table. But it will not succeed, for the end is still to come at the appointed time. So they get together to make an agreement. They're both lying through their teeth. And some scholars have indicated that table agreements were sacred, even amongst scoundrels. So this really was a low point in politics, even by the standards of the second century BC. They are lying to each other at the very place that was supposed to be held sacred as a place of truth. Ptolemy the sixth was ousted by his brother, Ptolemy the seventh, and he, Ptolemy the sixth, made promises to Antiochus that he never intended to keep. And of course, Antiochus the fourth made promises to Ptolemy the sixth that he never intended to keep, hoping that Ptolemy the sixth could help Antiochus conquer Egypt. So if Antiochus IV, Antiochus Epiphanes, gives Ptolemy VI, the ousted brother in exile, more power and some troops and some promises, they can work together to go conquer Egypt. And they've made promise to, promises to each other that neither will keep. Notice what's said at the end of verse 27, and this refrain happens throughout Daniel chapter 11. Its end is still to come at the appointed time. What does that mean? The, the appointed time here is God's time. All of these things, all of these events, all of these schemes, all of these machinations have an expiration date. And the expiration date is under the sovereign hand of Almighty God who rules all of history. All of these leaders, all of these rulers, as evil as they are, are always on God's short leash. Look at verse 28. Then he will return to his land, that is Antiochus IV, he'll return to his land with much plunder, but his heart will be set against the holy covenant, and he will take action, and then return to his own land. Think about Antiochus IV, on his way back home to Syria, set his heart against Israel, the land of the holy covenant. It is likely at this time that he killed 80,000 Jews, took 40,000 more of them prisoner, and sold many of them into slavery. He killed men, women, and children. He looted the temple in Jerusalem, and he put down a Jewish revolt. And the hard part for Israel in all of this, again, let's look at the map one more time. Israel is right between the yellow and the green. They are right in the crosshairs and the crossfire of these two empires doing war with one another. So Antiochus IV leaves Egypt, heads back home to Antioch, capital of Syria, and trudges his army right through Israel and makes mayhem there. Look at verse 29. At the appointed time, again, tipping our hat again to the sovereignty of God, he will return and come into the south but this last time, it will not turn out the way it did before. So he's going to go back to Egypt. And at this point, Antiochus IV wanted revenge because he had helped put Ptolemy VI back in power. He'd been exiled, ousted by his brother Ptolemy VII. Now Ptolemy VII is out. Ptolemy VI is back in. Antiochus IV helped him. And then he realized, oh, Ptolemy VI lied to me. How could he? Well, you were lying to him too. They lie to each other at the table. So Antiochus IV took a large army back through Israel into Egypt. And imagine being Israel at this point. They've just taken a bunch of people into slavery. They've just killed 80,000 men, women, and children in the land. And here comes that army again, now marching north to south. How awful would it be to live in between these two warring empires? So he goes back to Egypt. And then look at this. It will not turn out the way it did before. Verse 30, for ships of Kittim will come against him. This is an amazing point in history. Again, the, the details of Daniel's prophecy 400 years before the fact are exquisite. What happened to Antiochus IV on this military campaign? Ships of Kittim showed up. Kittim is the ancient word for Cyprus. That's the Mediterranean island under Roman control. This is the Roman navy. This is a reference to the Roman Empire. 
The Roman Senate sent a letter to Antiochus IV that he was no longer allowed to fight Egypt. They were putting an end to the Syrian wars. And that's a pretty remarkable thing for an upstart empire to do, to tell another empire what they can't do. But that is exactly what, Roman, what the Romans did. And it was the Roman Senate that passed a law, a law that said Antiochus IV is not allowed to invade Egypt anymore. And this letter from the Senate was delivered to Antiochus IV by a Roman commander. Rome was now in league with the Egyptians against the Syrians. You may remember from last week that Rome had already embarrassed the Syrians at the Battle of Magnesia, 190 BC, by defeating Antiochus IV's father, Antiochus III, humiliating him and demanding tribute. And ever since then, through two administrations, the Syrians had to pay large annual tribute to Rome that they could not afford. And now Rome had the audacity to interfere in Antiochus IV's incursions into Egypt. How else was he supposed to get plunder to pay off the Roman tribute? This letter from the Roman Senate was in the hands of the Roman commander, Gaius Popilius Lanus. And he stopped Antiochus IV in his tracks, handed him the letter. Antiochus IV requested to be able to confer with his government about whether he would abide by the Roman prohibition. Thank you for the letter from the Senate. Can I go talk to my board of directors and see what they say? The Roman commander drew a circle in the sand with a stick around Antiochus and said, you have to answer before you leave this circle. Surrounded by Roman troops, silent for some time, stewing. You can imagine the steam just coming out of the ears of Antiochus IV. He finally relented and turned his army around. This is why the angel reports to Daniel in this prophecy, in this prediction, it will not turn out the way it did before. And notice verse 30, look at his response. He will be disheartened, and he will return, and he will become enraged at the Holy Covenant and take action. Verse 30 takes us to the third stage of Antiochus IV's reign of terror. Here is where Antiochus IV, even more than before, turns his terrific, terrible, awful anger on Israel. This takes us from the second half of verse 30 through the end of our section in verse 35. Verse 30 says he's disheartened, he returns, he becomes enraged at the holy covenant and takes action. He will come back and he will show regard for those who forsake the holy covenant. Imagine Antiochus IV, humiliated by a commander with a stick in the sand drawing a circle around him. And he's got his whole army with him, and he has to retrace his steps. So the army's been geared up to fight. They didn't get to fight. They're armed to the teeth. They were ready to do battle with all of Egypt, and now they have to go home. And what is on the way? They have to march right back through Israel anyway. Might as well wreak some havoc. And listen, under the terrible reign of Antiochus IV, The soldiers were given liberty to do whatever they wanted, and you can imagine what they did. The Syrians were paying bribes to Jews who would undermine Judaism, just buying off the Jewish leadership. Listen to this testimony from 1 Maccabees 2. Therefore, come first and fulfill the king's commandment, they said, like as all the heathen have done. Yes, and the men of Judah also, and such as remain in Jerusalem. So shall you and your house be in the number of the king's friends, and you and your children will be honored with silver and gold and many rewards. This statement was made to a man named Mattathias. We'll come back to him in a moment. At this point, Antiochus IV Epiphany sought to completely eradicate Judaism entirely. It wasn't enough for him to take his army through, pick up a bunch of cool stuff, wreak some havoc, kill some people. He wanted to stamp out the law of Moses and the practice of Judaism and the existence of anything remaining of a flavor of Judaism. He had sought over years to Greekify the culture so as to stamp it out. 
And you know, throughout history, Old Testament history, intertestamental history, New Testament history, and church history, there have been a couple of paths whereby the enemies of God's people have sought to stamp them out, persecute them, make it physically difficult to be a follower of God, kill off the leadership, make martyrs of followers, make it illegal to be a Christian, make it illegal to practice Judaism. The enemies of God's people have taken these tacks. But there's another pathway that God's enemies have used. It was the pathway of Balaam. Balaam was prohibited by God from cursing God's people. And Balak and Balaam conspired together and said, well, if we can't get them by some prophetic curse against the people, we'll get them through worldliness. And so it was wine, women, and song as a temptation to get the Jewish people to defect from Yahweh. And that was effective. And God had to judge his people in the days of Balaam for their rebellion. The same strategy was followed by the Nicolaitans. We see them in the book of Revelation. The Nicolaitans may have been the followers of Nicholas. And Nicholas was one of the proto-deacons in Acts chapter 6 who may have become apostate. There is a sect named after him. If it is named after him, it is a tragic story of one who followed Christ and walked away and led a whole group of people to believe that they could have a little bit of Jesus and have sexual immorality as well. And the enemies of the way were able to infiltrate not by outright persecution and murdering Christians under the Nicolaitans, but by infiltrating the church with worldliness and immorality. These twin strategies murder God's followers and inculcate them with worldliness. Both of these were followed assiduously by Antiochus IV. He and his officials built Greek structures, Greek temples to worship the pantheon of Greek gods. He built gymnasia plural for gymnasium. We think of a gym as a place to go work out. That's kind of cool. Everybody should lift weights and all that kind of stuff. In Greek culture, the gymnasium was a, was a place of profligate immorality tied to athletics. It, it intentionally sought to get Jews to forsake the laws of Moses and to partake in worldly culture. He introduced institutional prostitution he set up temples in every city in Israel. He demanded worship at those temples of the Greek gods. He commanded his troops to cavort in the temple in Jerusalem, in Yahweh's temple in Jerusalem, with their lovers in order to defile it. He paid people to get along with this worldliness. He put people in power who would promote it. And then eventually he made it illegal to practice Judaism at all. Look at verse 31. Forces from him will arise. They will desecrate the sanctuary fortress. They will do away with the regular sacrifice. They will set up the abomination of desolation. This gets really serious. In 167 BC, Antiochus IV made it illegal and punishable by death to do the following things. Observe the Sabbath. Observe the Sabbath. For people to simply try to obey God's word and do what he said would become a capital offense. It marked them out as Jews and faithful to Yahweh, not going along with Antiochus' program. In one cave was found a cluster of women on the Sabbath trying their best to obey Sabbath observance in secret, out of sight, they were discovered by Antiochus' troops, pulled out of the cave, and all of them slaughtered on the spot. Another capital offense was circumcising your children. If your children were discovered to have been circumcised, the children themselves would be hung by their necks in front of their parents. Then the parents would be slain and their houses would be looted. Possessing copies of the Old Testament, any piece of a Torah scroll meant an instantaneous death sentence. If you went to the temple to partake in uh, sacrificial observances according to the law of Moses. That was a death sentence. If you observed the feast days according to Leviticus, 
That was a death sentence without trial. On December 16th, 167 B.C., we have the fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy here of the setting up of an abomination of desolation. Uh, that is, uh, that which is abominable that brings about utter devastation. An image of Zeus was set up by Antiochus Epiphanes in the temple. And pigs were slaughtered on the altar. They forced pork down the priest's throats. What a horrendous scene. A low point in Israel's history, persecuted by a satanically driven maniac seeking to annihilate Jews and Judaism altogether. What's interesting about this abomination of desolation is it itself is a foreshadowing of a greater abomination of desolation still to come. Daniel 9.24 makes it clear that that future one is still future from our vantage point, and Jesus made that case clear in Matthew 24.15. Neither of those were fulfilled in this Antiochus Epiphanes abomination of desolation. His was a type of the one to come, a preview as awful as it is. Look at verse 32, by smooth words, he will turn to godlessness those who act wickedly toward the covenant, but the people who know their God will display strength and take action. You have here a twin response amongst Jews to this rule of Antiochus Epiphanes. You had traitors to Judaism who joined forces, they were going against the covenant, and then you had those who believed their God, knew their God, displayed strength, and took action. Uh, One of those, history tells us, a man named Judas, Judas Maccabees. Maccabees is the word for hammer or the hammerer. He became known, Judas became known as the hammer. He was the son of Mattathias. Mattathias was the one who was spoken to by Uh, the king's officials in in 1 Maccabees 2.18 that I read a moment ago, the king's officials had demanded that uh, Matthias go along with Antiochus' program and he would be rewarded and he'd have money and riches. All of his sons would flourish. Here's Matthias' answer. Though all the nations that are under the king's dominion obey him and fall away every one from the religion of their fathers and give consent to his commandments, yet will I and my sons and my brothers walk in the covenant of our fathers. God forbid that we should forsake the law and the ordinances. We will not hearken to the king's words. We will not go from our religion, either on the right hand or the left. And so Mattathias, the father of Judas the Hammer, Judas the Maccabean became the beginning of the Maccabean revolt, after which 1st and 2nd Maccabees are named. This intertestamental period, what happens after God stops speaking through the prophets? By the way, the apocryphal literature during this time claims for itself that it is not the Word of God. I know the Catholics include it in their Bibles. It's not Scripture. It's not inerrant. It doesn't meet the standards of breathed out Scripture, but it is recorded history, some of it better history than other portions of it. Some of it is self-contradictory, but it does give a record of intertestamental times that is absolutely fascinating. In fact, in fact, it previews for us the backdrop of the history that takes place during the New Testament, when Christ comes. Why do you have people like the Zealots, Simon the Zealot, one of the disciples? Why do you have someone like Matthew, a tax collector, a sellout to Rome? And what strange disciple fellows those two make. And you see the the tensions of Jew-Gentile relationships on the pages of intertestamental history. It makes the New Testament make sense. By the way, you hear about this uh, mother with seven sons who die for refusing to eat a pork chop. Think about Peter's threefold vision of the pork chop picnic from the Lord. How difficult it was for Peter to swallow the idea that he would eat unclean foods contrary to Mosaic law now that the era has changed, given that people not too far behind him were giving up their lives being faithful to the laws of Yahweh under Mosaic regulation. Regulation. 
and we're willing to die for it. Peter says, oh, my mouth has never touched unclean food. And it doesn't matter how good a lobster tastes or how thick and juicy the pork chops are. There's something else at stake in table fellowship with Gentiles and eating unclean foods for New Testament history. And there's something absolutely shocking about Jesus putting Levi or Matthew and Simon the Zealot together to labor for the gospel. There's something else really remarkable about Jesus going into Gentile territories with these Jewish followers to preach good news to Gentiles. After all that they had been through, this helps paint the picture for us of the New Testament a little bit. There were skirmishes between the Maccabees and the Syrians. One of the battles was really interesting because the Syrian overlords had sent their armies to chase after this Judas the Hammer who was getting famous. Uh, they started with little marauding bands out of the hills and, and just picking little fights with trailing pieces of armies. But all of a sudden, the army goes after them and, and as faithful Sabbath observers, they chose not to defend themselves on a Saturday battle and they were slaughtered in droves. And the ones who escaped and ran away said, hmm, maybe we need to rethink this strategy. They waited till Saturday to attack because they knew we were Sabbath observers. Next Saturday, we're going to pray and we're going to defend ourselves. And from then on, the Maccabeans gained strength. They won some surprising victories. The fear of Judas the hammer spread throughout the Syrian empire. More Jews joined the cause. Eventually, they won back the temple precincts, they cleansed the temple, and on December 14th, 164 BC, they actually rededicated the temple. They lit it with candles for eight days in celebration of the reinstitution of animal sacrifices. This, of course, has become the celebration of Hanukkah that the Jews celebrate to this day. Look down at verse 33 of Daniel 11. Those who have insight among the people will give understanding to the many... Yet they will fall by sword and by flame, by captivity and by plunder for many days. All the sons of Mattathias were eventually killed by the Syrians, including Judas the Hammer. But there would be some who would teach and lead and help many to be faithful to the Lord. There would be others persecuted and martyred. Look at verse 34. When they fall, they will be granted a little help, and many will join them in hypocrisy. That's an interesting statement. What does Daniel mean by that? Well, that actually played out in the Maccabean history. They did receive a little help. Some joined their cause out of faithfulness to Yahweh and a desire to adhere to Mosaic law. But some joined in hypocrisy. That is, they were seeing, oh, Judas the hammer is getting popular. Looks like he's going to overthrow the Syrian overlords. We better join his team. And they were in it for political expediency. And so, really, the, the Maccabean revolt did not stand the test of time. In fact, the, the intertestamental literature of, of uh, First and Second Maccabees doesn't cover the fact that after the Syrians, the Romans came in and the Romans were the new overlords. The Israelites never had national sovereignty again. They are really still under God's judgment since the Babylonian exile. Look at verse 35. What is the purpose of all of this? Some of those who have insight will fall in order to refine, purge, and make them pure until the end of the time, literally, because it is still to come at the appointed time. The end of the time here is simply a reference to the end of the rule of Antiochus Epiphanes. There's another time coming. We'll pick that up next week. What's interesting about this segment of Scripture, it is a preview of the last period of Daniel 11, which we'll get to next time, the time of the Antichrist himself. Jeremiah 30 will refer to that time still yet to come as the worst period of human history and the time of Jacob's trouble. Jacob, being Israel, was troubled during the time of Antiochus IV, the anti-Antichrist. But they will be troubled yet further under the reign of Antichrist. And what's interesting about these two periods of history, though they are similar, and we'll look at the differences next week, they are distinguishable. And the details of Daniel 11 matter in understanding that. 
But the similarities are interesting in terms of a stated purpose of the purification of God's people. That helps us understand what is the purpose for the great tribulation yet to come. What is the purpose of the Antichrist reign yet to come? We, we look every time at Daniel 11, at the appointed time, the appointed time, the appointed time. These are God's appointed times. Therefore, they are under God's sovereign purposes. They fit with the entire scope and sequence of the book of Daniel, which, whose theme is the sovereignty of God, the orchestrator of all history. And they fit those statue visions that we got in the beginning of Daniel that described the Babylonians, the Medo-Persians, the Greeks, and then the Romans in two parts. We've seen the gap between Rome part one and Rome 2.0. And the stated purpose of all of that is for Israel. That gives us a clue. God's stated purpose for the anti-antichrist is going to be parallel to God's purpose for the antichrist in his terrible reign yet to come. Antiochus IV died in 163 BC in Persia, miserable, humiliated, defeated. And as he was dying and probably going crazy, he was crazy his whole life, but going really crazy at the end, just learning that the Jews had successfully revolted against his rule in Israel. He outgunned them, he outmanned them, he outmoneyed them. How many people did he slaughter? He humiliated the Jews every way he knew how, and yet God still had his purposes on his people Israel, and Antiochus IV would go off the page of history. Done. And he met his maker. Let me give you some takeaways. Again, two layers of takeaways here. Uh, Some implications for Israel first. If you were an Israelite, if you were a Jew in Babylonian captivity getting Daniel's prophecy, or if you were a Jew in the subsequent generations reading Daniel 11, what should your takeaway be? Uh, Number one, I would hope you would be fortified for faithfulness in a time of trial and purification. And I think by illustration, that is exactly the, the kind of fortification we saw in those seven brothers and courageous mother by the record of 2 Maccabees 7. I think another purpose of this would be, would be comfort in the trial. We saw again and again in this chapter, the appointed time. We have a sovereign God. He limits the chaos. Satanic schemes and human intrigue are always on God's short leash. God's people would need to take comfort in that. All of these times are appointed times, limited times. We saw in the unfolding of Antiochus' reign back in Daniel chapter 8, a limiting of his atrocities to 2,300 days. That's important. We'll see that again in the book of Revelation, a limiting of Antichrist's rule and reign. They don't get an unlimited sphere to do whatever they want to do as long as they want to do it. As satanic and evil as these tyrannical rulers are, they are all on God's short leash. And a third takeaway is that God is committed to purifying Israel. God is committed to his people. They will still exist, even if under his tutelage of judgment, even if under his corrective discipline in exile, faithful Israelites could trust God's good hand in this for the nation. And they could pray for the peace of Israel. Uh, we, We saw this in those seven brothers confidence in God's future plans for Israel. We see this in someone like the Apostle Paul, who lived during the era where Israel rejected and murdered her own Messiah and was apostate as a nation in the first generation after Messiah came. And Paul laments over the nation, and yet he commands the Galatians at the end of that letter, pray for the peace of Israel. Still on his heart. Ought to be on our hearts as well. Some takeaways for us. I think we see a little bit the difficulty of Jew-Gentile relationships in the first century of the church. This helps us get an understanding of the gospel's power in racial reconciliation, ethnic division, political intrigue, and difficulty. What does God do in the church? Sew together people of all kinds of different backgrounds who have natural and geopolitical and ethnic hostilities against each other. And the gospel does amazing things. It's a really remarkable, and I think the more we see the ethnic difficulties in the pages of the New Testament, 
I think the more we ought to see the difficulties of ethnic hostility and tension in our own day probably pale in comparison. These things ought to be remedied by the gospel in the local church. It's also a reminder for us not to trust in princes. We covered this last week. Don't trust in princes. In mortal man in whom there is no hope, he goes to the grave and his thoughts with him. And he meets his maker. Uh, We don't trust in human governments. They come and they go. There are shifting sands. They are not the bedrock, solid foundation that is Christ. You build your house of hope on the next election cycle, and it will crumble with the coming tide. You build your hope on Christ. That is solid bedrock. The answer to man's problem is not found in politics. A third takeaway for us, and we'll close with this. Do not worship at the altar of comfort or popularity or ease, whether political or societal ease. A really remarkable portion from 2 Maccabees chapter 4 says this, 2 Maccabees 4, uh, 16. By reason of sore calamity, by, by reason thereof, sore calamity came upon the people of Israel. For they had them to be their enemies and avengers, whose custom they followed so earnestly, and unto whom they desired to be liked in all things. For it is not a light thing to do wickedly against the law of God. Uh, What the writer of 2 Maccabees records there is that the Jews who went worldly, they bought a gymnasium membership. And again, that's different than our gyms today. You can keep your gym card. That's fine. Um, But they just bought into the pagan idolatries, the pagan rituals, the immorality, the sensuality, the sexual immorality, all of it. They bought into it. And they wanted to be liked by their overlords, and they liked them. Their affections were drawn away from the law of God, and they were drawn to the things that were offered them, sometimes under pain of death. Like, my life's just going to be easy if I go Greek. And out of a love of comfort and a love of ease, they sold their souls. Look, we talked about the Balaamite and the Nicolaitans, and there is a threat to the evangelical church today. Sure, there are the enemies of the church. There are people who might want to just shut the church down outright. They, they might want to make Christianity illegal if they could. You may have friends and family members who persecute you, mistreat you, disown you because you follow Christ. All of that is hard and difficult. There is a perhaps more insidious danger to the church, and that is the Balaamite Nicolaitan doctrine of holding out worldly infatuations to the church. Oh yeah, you can have a little bit of Jesus, but life's just going to be a lot easier if you go along with the ways of this world too. Buy into the sensualities, buy into the immoralities, it's no big deal. Or for the church to take up as its mantle the desire to be liked, the desire to be cool, the desire for our overlords to appreciate us and not punish us. Yeah, we'll we'll back off of convictional strong statements that the government may say we shouldn't be saying. Life will go easy. We can continue on with our Christianity and we'll just shave this and shave that and that is a slippery slope demise for the church. And it takes insight. It takes the people of God with courage and prayer and discernment to withstand the tide, particularly when Christian leaders have been bought by that sellout and want to convince us that the nice thing to do in our culture is to live like the culture to be appreciated. We dare not, we must not. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for these lessons from an ancient prophecy fulfilled in exquisite detail in our history books, pointing to a still yet future that is as sure in its details. 
We place our confidence in your word. We pray that the takeaways that address our own hearts would sink deeply. We pray, oh God, to be faithful. We thank you for those who have gone ahead, gone before us, who have stood on solid bedrock of trust in your word and have done so even at the cost of their own lives. May we be so courageous. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.